Hi folks, you're uh, not here for me, you're here for the puppets, right? And our special guest, uh, I'll just say a few words briefly, that uh, hard is something that's uh, not easy to get onto the screen from uh, speaking as a filmmaker to try and get what you're intending onto the screen and affect your audience and make them love what you're doing and love your characters is not an easy thing, but when it happens, it really is magical. And uh, Ardman uh, Studios, established in 1972, uh, they are a stop-motion animation studio as well as a computer-generated animation studio. Uh, they, more than arguably any other studio, has succeeded at getting their heart onto the screen, and the, the quality of their work speaks uh, for itself, really, and what's on screen. Uh, somehow they have managed over the years to navigate their way uh, through the sea monsters and the uh, shallow waters to uh, pull off... Um, nearly countless when you check the IMDb page, uh, short films, commercial films, uh, feature length uh, films, it's astonishing really. And uh, they do it, as I said, with heart. And so speaking of heart, we have with us today very much the heart of Ardman Studios, uh, Peter Lord. Peter Lord is uh, a captain of his own uh, company and is a captain of his own pirate ship in that uh, he has managed to, to, to make Ardman what it is today. We're very lucky to have uh, him with us today. And as a stop motion animator, I have to say, I'm, I'm quadruply excited to be able to spend some time with him. He is the co-director of uh, Ardman's latest feature film, Pirates, Band of Misfits. And uh, that's it. Please welcome Peter Lord. Get one thing out of the way, Peter, yeah. first. I've been following you on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else has been following Peter on Twitter? He has developed an unusual interest. Would you like to tell us a bit more? <laughs> what well, uh, yes. <coughs> well, well, I've been I've been on tour uh, prom um, uh, promoting the film, and um, uh, and it's kind of a, a hard and lonely existence, and. Um, uh, you end up in these hotels, and I've become increasingly fascinated by the the variety of pillows they give you in hotels around the world. Quite in, inordinate mountains of pillows. I mean, it, it's very hard for one man to cope with seven pillows at any one time. And I'm just astonished by them. And then that was the first thing that interested me. And then, and then, then, uh, and then, having time on my hands, and I started to become equally focused on the uh, the chocolate that was left for you at, at night. And so some hotels left no chocolate, <laughs> and therefore <laughs> they got a pretty bad press on Twitter, I can tell you. Uh, but I have to say, fair play to Toronto. Not only were there chocolates, but also there was a rather magnificent um, version of what's it The CN Tower, is it called? It. Yeah, the, the, in chocolate as well. <laughs> pretty, <laughs> so well done. Well done, Toronto. Fine, fine city. Yeah. And six pillows. Trust me, follow the man on Twitter. Comedy, comedy, comedy. Uh, so, Ardman Studios, way back in the day, I have to say, growing up, uh, Vision On. Yes, crikey, yes. Wow. Yeah, very influential. Was it? Very influential. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Oh gosh, absolutely. wow, wow. And can you take us back, because the first thing we're going to watch is uh, Adam. Right. So, can you take us back to Ardman in those days? And in the what very... Was like? right, yeah. Yes. Um, so... Uh, so the story, the studio is was started out as two schoolboys. Um, we 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 actually met. Um, I met my partner Dave when we were both twelve. I know that exactly because that's when I came to the school and I sat down next to him in the in, in the one empty seat left in the classroom. Uh, that was in sixty six, and so we're still working together now. Um, and. Uh, when we were about 16, we were encouraged to try animating, to experiment with animation, encouraged by his father, actually. Before then, I just had a normal, healthy uh, adolescent interest in animation, like who, do, like who doesn't? You know, I liked it, but, but I never thought it was... 
I never dreamt it was a career. It was just, it was a thing that other people did. And uh, I was a fan variously of, you know, Hanna-Barbera cartoons, of um, Disney films, of Ray Harryhausen's monster movies, and, and just breaking just at that very t- key time in our lives, um, the animation that Terry Gilliam did for the Monty Python TV series. So all those things were influences and we we started animating one day like we had a rainy afternoon we were on working on his kitchen table and we just made some pictures move on the table kind of terry gilliamish actually and that and then uh this was all shot on a, a 16 mil bolex um three or four days later we it came back from the labs and we saw it and we played it in the living room and it was great, you know, it was fantastic because it was it it, it was moving, it was just magical. Um the the most simple thing, the the first, you know, absolutely page one for animators is that uh excitement and joy of bringing something to life. Even just making it move, for heaven's sake, was was exciting to start with. So that was where we started. And um and then uh l- it's necessary that a story like this should include a little, little dash of nepotism because um, his his father uh, worked in the BBC. He made religious programmes. He was um, a priest, a vicar. And uh, he made the contact with the producer of the programme you've mentioned, which is Vision On, which is, wow, I'm amazed anyone knows that. That was, that was from way, way back. Uh, and we made the contact with the, with the guy from Vision On and we sold him eventually one short film drawn animation 20 seconds long uh, uh, an approximate superhero character um, that we called Ardman and that was a hilarious joke when when we were 16 because it it was like Superman and Aardvark the Ard of (laughs) The Ard of Ardvark and the Man of Superman. He didn't look like an uh, Ardvark at all, but he, was just lo- he looked like a fat Superman, actually. And, um, but we called him Ardman. And then BBC si- paid us, you know, the 20 quid or whatever and said, who should we make, who should we make the check out to do? And like fools, we said, um, make it out to Ardman Animations. If we'd said, make it out to... Lord Sproxton animations, we'd be famous now. But as it is, we didn't do that, and so we, ch- we chose Hardman as the name, and uh, and that was and that was it. Um, and that, that was, so we got started. And I now see, I now see how lucky we were. I mean, I think I always say to to young to students and people, I say, you know, you need talent. You know, you need you need, you need talent. You need perseverance. You need flair, and and a big dash of. Good luck and good timing uh, certainly are important too. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, around the time also was the morph character, and morph then uh, connected to Adam in terms of you know, looking for a different audience. I yes, guess. I don't suppose anyone knows morph. Do you know, anyone know morph? Yes, oh, 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 that's morph. Okay. oh, good. Oh, oh. oh, oh nice. <laughs> good. Well, I, good. <laughs> He's about that big. He's made of solid clay, and I th- we did morph for several years for. Um, well, in total, 20 years, I think, he kept going. And um, uh, I, that was the first character we ever created that had a, a developing, running, evolving character. And uh, solid plasticine, so therefore quite difficult to work with. Quite Really, now I look back and think, wow, that was impressive. Because he was just solid clay. He had no skeleton, no armature, no armature inside him. Um, just clay. He only stood up because his feet were kind of sticky. And or else we were hanging on a fishing line, and we made all these films where, it, which it was a, a masterpiece of performance and the balancing was the, was the trick. So he didn't fall over, and we did this for years and years. And I was really, I am very proud of Morph. I think it's a very good character, and we and some of our stories were very good. And it really annoyed the hell out of me that that back then nobody took it seriously. I mean, um, festivals didn't take it seriously because. We were into the world of international film festivals, and and because it was for kids, no no one took it seriously. I was really uh, hurt by that, and so um, I made this film called Adam, which was because uh, Adam is very light morph, uh, but with genitals basically. That's 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 basically the difference. And um, 
so there was a, a, a sort of a. It was a it was a play it was a play on animation as well because it was about um it was a he was a puppet and there was there's a human hand apparently literally animating him. And is that you? Is that your? Hand? It wasn't me. No, some some so was two other people's hands. Two other people's hands. Yes, I had the hand of. Uh, do you know? Do you know Angry Kid? Does anyone know Angry Kid? Yeah, the man who orig- who originally was wearing the mask in Angry Kid was called Nick Upton, and he was the hand of um, the hand of God, and he was also he also performed in um, Tom Thumb, the Bolex Brothers, extraordinary film. And so Nick he Upton, can, he can sit still for a long period. He's very good at sitting. He's very good at sitting still. Should we watch Adam? Yes, sir. watch. Adam. We're back. We're going to go from Adam to Chicken Run. What a... Tell us. Because <laughs> Adam's beautiful. Yes. Chicken Run, major motion picture, major major studio involvement, American studio involvement, big league stuff. Yeah. Well, so we made Adam. Uh, Adam in 1990, perhaps? I don't know. <laughs> a long, a while. And it was a small studio then. We were about um, uh, 10, 12 people sort of thing, um, which uh, is a great, it's a lovely time. I, mean, I recommend it highly to you all. I mean, I mean, it's very wonderful to have a huge studio with 200 people or more, but, um, but 10 people is great, you know, because everyone knows everyone else. It's very intimate and they're all really focused. Um... And after we'd done Adam, yeah, following quite close on the heels of Adam, we started to make uh, The Wrong Trousers, Nick's second Wallace and Gromit film. And that was you know, fantastic. It's, a, it's such a great film. And we, it was shown quite widely in places like uh, film festivals, like the Venice Film Festival, and I think at Sundance and places like that. And... It was made for TV. It was funded by the BBC. But then we started to see it on the big screen and thought, wow, that really looks pretty good on the big screen. That's really, it's holding the screen and, and uh, you know, moving an audience, getting big reactions. And it, then it won the Oscar. And that was kind of, that was basically our, our in, I think. Because then, then um, American studios started. Um, studios started to be interested in, in us, so we were we were courted by, by by all the studios in in Hollywood, and um, and we and we increasingly had the confidence, and we had the the man we the, the team built because Adam was a, a you know a single handed operation virtually with a you know with, with lighting cameraman and a little bit of engineering. Um, the Wrong Trousers was made with a team of 20 people, perhaps. Quite small, really. Then we made 
a close shave and that probably had 60 people. So what I'm saying in this is that we were learning gradually how you could, and I hate to use this word, but I will just once, how you could industrialize the process because it started out as such a purely artisan thing, you know, one animator, a lump of clay, some animation, and we discovered the way we could increase its scale, that you could find other animators that were good and that could work together and, and look like one performance. Uh, and so, so we got better and better, and <clears throat> eventually, um, having, been, having been extensively courted, we had this idea, which was, which was our idea, that we were kind of you know, offering to the studios, you know, like dangling it there like a bit, you know, which, and, and the, the big selling point, the, uh, the, the Hollywood pitch was the great escape with chickens, which I have to say was a great pitch. I mean, I, I think, I, 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 I do think, I do think actually seriously that is a really good pitch because that's what I'm always, I'm always looking for something like that, something which is kind of, something which has a simplicity about it that when you hear it, your mind goes racing ahead to what that's going to be. Oh, yes, that would be fun. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. And the fact that, that chickens are such, you know, such underrated animals, aren't they? Chickens, they've got such a bad rep. Uh, nobody appreciates chickens. And um, the fact that we could to put these chickens who, who, heaven knows, are almost proverbial for being cowardly, right? Proverbially, proverbially cowardly chickens into a really her heroic setting it was was why it was such a good idea. We pitched that to um, Steven Spielberg, amongst others, and he was very polite and he liked it. And uh, he said he, the Great Escape was his favourite film. Plus, he kept chickens, so that was fortunate. And, uh, <laughs> and 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 then we started to make it. And I I must give full credit to to DreamWorks because that they they. They part funded it. We had some funding from Pathé as well at that time. They part funded it, and and they gave us a lot of um, practical help, again to to uh, extend the operation again to a yet a, to a yet a bigger scale. Let's watch some chicken run. Ginger, back from holiday? I wasn't on holiday, Babs. I was in solitary confinement. Oh, it's nice to get a bit of time to yourself, isn't it? The funny thing is, seeing it now, what strikes me is that, in fact, Almost all the references to The Great Escape were jammed into that title sequence. In fact, yeah, because when we thought we were, when we thought of the idea, yeah, in The Great Escape, they uh, they spend about 
an hour and a quarter escaping and then the rest of the time being caught and killed. And um, I thought our film would be all about that, would be all about digging tunnels. I thought, yeah, I thought they spent a lot of time underground, but we squeezed all the title sequence. And, yeah. It's very crafty view. Great way to establish character two and premise right off the top in that Yeah, very, very straight in there. Right? Yeah, yeah. So let's talk a bit about Nick Park, yes. whom from a recent Simpsons episode, I understand that he's now more clay than man. Yes. Is that true? <laughs> That's true, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Nick, um, so I've mentioned that I started the company with um, Dave Sproxton, we were at school together, and sometime in the early 80s, we were invited to the National Film School um, to lecture. Uh, and um, and whilst there, we met a student, that was Nick Park, um, and there was a, we were naturally drawn together because we, like, we were the only three people in the world we knew that were, that were doing what this thing, this clay animation thing. Uh, Nick had seen our work. He'd seen Morph and he'd seen um, a film called Down and Out that we made. So he knew our work, which, which I think is probably what got him started in the first place because he's like um, five or six years younger. And um, then we saw what he was doing. And fun enough, what I remember, he was, he was making a grand day out and he only just started when we met him. Um, and there wasn't much to see. In fact, what, there was the only scene I... Th I remember it was Wallace um, trying to draw the rocket. Actually, he was trying to draw. He was sitting at a, at a drawing desk trying to draw the rocket, very with a big clumsy pencil, and um, uh, and and then sort of fingering his chin thoughtfully. And and that gesture, which God knows is not exactly subtle, you know, if you to, to show your thinking, it's not it's not subtle, but it was it was the right kind of thing that that. Uh, you didn't see much of that in puppet animation. It's, it's, uh, it's so strange to say it now, because uh, now it's so. What we do is so sophisticated, and the acting is so sophisticated. But at the time, we thought, "Oh, that's smart. That's that's the right idea." He's he, you know, M Wallace wasn't just moving; he was thinking. In that case, that was the thing, uh, and that was the first thing. And then later, he showed us a test of Wallace saying. Uh, we've forgotten the crackers with his with his big wide mouth. And I thought, well, that's funny. You know, how could how could it be funny just to speak? And that was that was a great trick that Nick that Nick invented. So uh, in the fullness of time, uh, Nick was making this film a grand day out very slowly because he was all on his own, doing everything: camera, lighting, set building, you know, everything on his own. And um, you know he. It took him. I think he was on. I think he was on it for like six years. That film. And it's twenty minutes long, you know. Um, so, uh, and of that twenty minutes, the last uh, eight or he he did an hard man because it, it looked like he was going to just spend the rest of his life making this film. So we said, "Why come and work with us?" We said, "Come come to our man, and you can help us do some." morph and 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 commercials and stuff like that and finish your film so that's what happened and uh so he became part of the team uh first of all he became part of the team there was a brief period when he would make the tea uh and sweep the floor but then uh after that um we started making tea for him and co-director <laughs> credits right, right. yeah so there's Wallace and Gromit on the small screen and for film festivals. And then in time, though, you're in the feature film world now. And so Wallace and Gromit making it to the big screen, which is the next thing we're going to yeah. look at. It's Curse of the Were Rabbit. Yeah, because Nick always wanted to, you know, he loves Wallace and Gromit. He loves them. They're, they're, they're very, very dear to him. He invented them. He loves them. And um, he was very, always wanted to make a feature. Always thought he would make a feature. Uh, and... And then one day he told me this idea, which was like um, the, the vegetarian horror movie, the idea that the, 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 what, the, um, the Wallace would become like a, like a werewolf, except he was a vegetarian, and that Wallace would be hunting himself. And I thought, wow, that's great. Again, you could see, you could see all how that's going to play out. You know, that's, what I, that's what I look for in the story, that, um, that your mind goes racing full of uh, racing ahead of the film or was the, seeing the hilarious potential so that was his pitch and um, that was made for again well, at, at working with DreamWorks um, 
they gave us a very respectable amount of space though because it was not Nick's, Nick's creation. Uh, and Nick teamed up with a um, long-term animator, collaborator, Steve Box, and they, they co-directed it. Let's watch a clip. Watch that. Look, this flipping vegetable competition causes nothing but trouble every year. Here we go. If you ask me, you know, I'll tell you. If you ask me, this was arson. Arson? Aye, someone arson around. <laughs> That's right. What have you learned? A man. This was no man. Hey. <laughs> Does a man have teeth the size of axe blades? <laughs> or ears like terrible tombstones? <laughs> By tampering with nature, forcing vegetables to swell far beyond their natural size, we have brought a terrible judgment upon ourselves. You're mental. And for our sins, a hideous creature has been sent to punish us all. Repent! Repent! Lest you too taste the wrath of... The Were-Rabbit! Good response. And Ardman's ability to connect with an audience yeah. and, and get it across. Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Yes, yes, that's right. it's really, really funny. I mean, it's great, great stuff. Um, How come Ardman's stuff is so funny? <laughs> Well, I have no idea. I have absolutely. I have. N I have no idea. What it, I don't know. I. It's so hard. To, you know, it's so hard to talk about comedy because when as soon as you talk about it, it slips through your fingers, doesn't it? Like water, you can't. You can't um, hold it. Um, and people say, "Oh, why is it so funny? Why is it so English?" I have no idea why. Well, I know why it's English. It's because we're English. That's why. It's, that's why it's English. But what that means I, is, I find it very, very hard to. Um, to to explain, I mean, Nick. It's funny in there the arson gag. You know, Nick. Nick loves puns. In the most, he's addicted. To, he's addicted to puns. When 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 he writes as, as soon as he starts writing a new idea, he starts coming up with puns. Which is that's that's his thing. That's his shtick. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't like puns. Actually. <laughs> but uh, but I, I uh, but uh, I, I see they work though. You know, they've become they've sort of become legendary in England. The, 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 these outrageous puns. The, the, yeah. It's funny because, like, here's the interesting thing. Like, in the, in, like, I can't imagine um, a, any other performer coming out with us with puns, and people actually like being very happy with it. But he's got this kind of this wonderful sort of cheerful, cheerful confidence and innocence about what he does. And, and, and the thing about Nick, as a creative person, is he just has perfect ta uh, taste, comic taste. You know, like. He just, I mean, I've, it's the interesting thing is about a director. People sometimes say, oh, what does a director do? And, uh, which is a fair question. And, um, uh, and, and one thing you do is you, is, is you just make decisions the whole time. You know, like it's just, and that might be, you know, it might be as banal as that blue or that blue, you know, or it might be as banal, you know, make, make his nose bigger or 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 it might be you know um shall we use um this actor or that actor you know big decision, you know huge decisions tiny decisions but every day decisions 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 and that actually is kind of what ends up on the screen the choices that you've made um because yeah and um and and nick's and nick of course comes up with jokes of course he comes up with jokes himself then you select jokes offered to you by other people um storyboard artists are offering you jokes the whole time and which which one you choose 
becomes your is your a sign of your taste. And Nick's taste is just fantastic. Decisions and choices, and we looked at the the difference between a film like uh, Adam to uh, Chicken Run. The next thing we're going to see is Arthur Christmas, yeah. and uh, the idea of navigating and moving your way through challenges. So with Arthur Christmas, it's an example of where I've been moving from, or not. That's not, not, not your first CG feature, but uh, stop motion that's so tactile and so physical into something that's computer generated. Mm. Can you tell us a bit about that process? It's a whole other world, isn't it? It's, it's so different. Um, <coughs> this, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. This project uh, was 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 offered to us by the, again by the writer by Peter Bainham. He had the idea, and. Um, Sarah Smith, the director, was working with us at the time. Um, they were both totally fired up to make it. I thought it was a great idea. And it was so ambitious in scale because they fly all around the world. They fly all around the world, for heaven's sake. And there's like a million elves. Um, and it did seem like a very natural candidate to be a CG movie. Although I must say, <clears throat> we could have done it in stop frame. Somehow, we would have done it somehow, but uh, it seemed a very natural candidate. There was also a, pr a practical thing that we wanted to shoot two films kind of at the same time, <clears throat> and we simply didn't have the space or the manpower to do uh, a second stop frame film. So it was partly, <coughs> excuse me, partly a creative decision, partly a Practical decision, partly a business decision. All those things together. Um, uh, incredible challenge. Um, to, because we did it quick. And we didn't have, we don't have, um, an established CG studio. We do quite a lot at Ardman. We have qu quite a large team. But not the incredible pipeline that you need for full-scale production. So we knew we were going to partner with somebody. And it could have been anybody. We looked all around. We considered partners in London, in Sydney, um, in Paris. We, we ended up in LA with um, Sony's Imageworks team. And uh, so a major partnership. We, we deliberately um, <clears throat> raised it like a gardener from a seed in Bristol, nurturing the little fellow in, in our hometown in our studio, almost on principle that, that, that we should, everyone should feel that, <coughs> that we owned it. And all, all the first stages, all the story development, um, much of the storyboarding, the design work was done in Bristol. And then we took it to Imageworks Studio in Culver City to do it. And it was pretty arduous, I must say, because um, there's all, there's, there's a lot to learn. Um, new people, you know, new new partnerships, new teams. You know, it, it was um, it was difficult. It was difficult, but they they did a fantastic job. Yeah. And uh, and what was and what was the same? What was the same? Well, um, the British sensibility again. The British sensibility in the writing. Uh, some of the design work was. Our man grown, as it were, the storyboarding, some of the key animators. We, we took um, a, a few key animators from Bristol, some of whom were only uh, CG animators and some of whom, like a guy called Seamus Malone, for example, who was a stop frame animator who'd, who'd crossed over, you know, gone, gone bad. Uh, and, um, and, and so he went and, work, and worked on it as well. Let's watch a clip. Okay. First field elf battalion set. Straight in that teddy bear, soldier. Love. Field elves jingle, jingle, jingle. Drop time 18.14 seconds per household.
I mean, that's interesting because Sarah wanted to do... Um, she wanted to shoot that sequence like that, like suit, like super action sequence. Not, the whole film isn't isn't shot that way at all, but that sequence wanted to be. And you know, you, yeah, you could have done that in stop frame, but that would be that would be quite an achievement in stop frame. Yeah. On, on the topic of story and story development, so the script was developed in house, and the process of going from the basics of a story and then plussing it and and building up gags and and adding stuff. And can you tell us a bit about the process at Ardman and how it works? Well, yes. Um, yeah. We spent a long time on the story. I'm not sure everyone says that. Um, it's amazing how long a story takes for an animated film. It's uh, just to, to get the outline, to get the outline of the events, the right sort of length, the right sort of order. It's amazing how long that takes. Um, and... So we spend a long time on that. You get that right, and that's—I suppose you would say—that was like treatment stage, um, and then then the script is written. And yes, we do. We we we, we work with comedy writers. That's what we do. You know, we. Um, I would say here's a, here's a thing which maybe is slightly contentious. Maybe I I don't know what I don't know what someone from Pixar would say. I've never had this conversation with them, but it is true that what we don't the, the 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 emotional story although it's important to us very important to us it doesn't dominate storytelling i kind of believe in in working out the the narrative and then finding what it's saying rather than sometimes i think that in in the hollywood model someone that you you you've find your lead character, you say, what's their problem? You know, what's, what, what arc will this person go on? And then you plan that out, and then that, that's the story you tell. In a sort of rather mechanistic way, I rather believe in trying to tease out what is the emotional problem. Chicken Man is interesting, because Chicken Man was uh, written by, the, the final script was written by a guy called Kerry Kirkpatrick, an, um, an American writer, very nice guy, working with Nick and me very closely. I would say, very simply put, that Nick and me um, suggested the comedy and, and Carey tried to make it into an emotional narrative. And he could never really find much of a story for Ginger, who is our lead. And it kind of frustrated him because it was, it was counter to his Hollywood instincts because she, you know, I mean, she has a story, um, but she doesn't sort of learn some massive lesson. There was a, there's, there's something in there. There is something in there, but enough to make him happy, so he could rest easy at night. She, 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 she had an arc. She does have an arc, but a pretty shallow one, you know. And it was quite fun. But I think I still think it's a really great film. I don't think I don't I don't believe that films are about um, moral education. You know, it's not what they're for. I don't think. I mean, it's 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 an interesting element, um, and sometimes it's entirely valuable, but. That's not what films... Don't, films don't need to be about that, you know. They, I think they can be more about, um, you know, being true about the human condition, I think, is a good thing. Anyway, that was one thing. And then plussing it, um, storyboard is the, is the classic place where it gets plussed. And that was interesting as well because, <laughs> because on Chicken Run, we didn't... We barely knew what a story department was um, because... Nick and I came from a tradition where our tradition was that you wrote a you wrote a story, then you storyboarded it, then you shot it. That was where we came from, and we were greatly astonished to go to DreamWorks and and find that they were saying, "Okay, now what we need now is a story blitz." What the hell is a story blitz? A story a story blitz is is that twelve story artists try to draw the film as quickly as possible to get on the screen so you can see it playing out in real time which is I can see the point now I do get that. I get it now but the, but the way the 12 story artists all sort of telling each each telling the story in his or her own way it, the, it's kind of weird and it's unfo it gets very unfocused if you if you're not careful and goes all over the place uh, that's the negative side the plus side is that the best ones come up with really funny ideas you know I mean that just that um, it's just one tiny thing but you know that um that gag with the um, with the with the organ in the, the wear out. Yeah, that was that was a story artist's idea. You know, so yeah, it wasn't in the script. 
uh, a story I just thought of it, suggested it. Oh, that's funny, and it's in. So lots of those those things happen the whole time. On the topic of character arcs and shallow character mm -hmm. arcs, yep. uh, the pirate. Yes. And, <laughs> Good point. And uh, you, you've got a feature film that's about to come out. Sure. Uh, let's just talk about pirates. Okay. Um, so um, it was right there. Oh, yeah, the the power of a puppet in the room. <laughs> like that. Yes. So. Um, so, The Pirate's Band of Misfits is the story about this guy. And um, he's obviously, as his costume suggests, I think, he's, the, he's the, the captain of the pirate ship. His name is the Pirate Captain. That's the only name he, he has. <laughs> and um, he's got, a, he's got a, a, a hopeless crew. He's, a, he's an astonishingly bad um, sailor, really. So, so much so he doesn't know... Yeah, he says at one stage, it's kind of hard to hear actually in the, in the mix, he says, fire those long things that go bang, which is kind of <laughs> symptomatic of the sort of, sort of, um, so he's not a very good sailor, but he's, but he, he he's a very good pirate. It's like, there's a, it's a funny thing, we, we take a sort of, um, like some sort of platonic ideal of what a pirate ought to be, and that's what he aspires to, uh, even though it's completely, um, impractical and unrealistic and even though he's not very good at it uh, he, he wants it's it, written by an Eng, an, another English author a young man a young guy wrote a book which inspired the film extremely funny book really really funny book full of surprises and full of life and uh, vigour he wrote the screenplay as well and it has a, an extraordinary tone which I find it very very hard who can talk about tone? It's so hard to describe it, but um, it's very mischievous, uh, very unsolemn. It has a kind of a wide-eyed innocence about it, even though the writer himself isn't innocent at all. He's actually quite he's a knowing, sophisticated writer, but he writes with this feigned innocence, which is really charming. And, um, and it's quite a modern tone as well, like even though everyone is dressed, uh, well, uh, in... In the, it's a period drama, obviously. It's a period <laughs> drama, but the tone is quite modern throughout. The, I mean, um, the pirate's loyal, um, very loyal lieutenant says he's very worried about some idiotic decision he's making because the captain is always making idiotic decisions. And he says, Captain, do you, do you remember that little talk we had? And I mean, I'm sure no pirate's ever said that. Ever, you know, that's not that's not pirate talk, is it? You know, uh, he says, do you remember that little talk we had? And to which the pirate captain replies, well, "The one about whether pigs are a type of fruit." <laughs> and and is the lieutenant is surprised? No, no. The one about this, uh, avoiding harebrained schemes that end as, as facing certain death. Or, uh, that's the way it plays. Anyway, but a modern tone, anyway. A very modern, a very astonishing, a very surprising tone, most unlike um, your regular pirate movie. And they go, they, they, have, they go on an adventure. The captain wants to win the Pirate of the Year award, which is like the, bit, the Oscars of piracy. And, uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's one of those va foolish, vaunting ambitions because he's no good. He really is no good. When you get to the, um, he gets to the tavern and he meets the opposition, and there's uh, Black Bellamy, who's wanted poster says wanted for, for a terrible piratical crime is a hundred thousand doubloons or something, and uh, Cutlass Liz is fifty thousand doubloons, and Peg Leg Hastings is twenty five thousand doubloons, and the captain's wanted poster says uh, twelve doubloons and a free pen. Uh, <laughs> So anyway, so so he wants he wants his thing, even though he's he's got n no no credentials to get it, and and now we come to the story. Now we come to the story because he wants something which is kind of it's vain and it's kind of bad for him, and we we sense it's bad for him. And uh, and in in reaching out for the big prize, he nearly loses the really important thing, which is his his crew. And it is a uh, I saw an industry screening last week. It's deeply funny in the way where there's several scenes onward and then you get the joke from a few scenes back mm -hmm. and it hits you and uh, it's funny. It's a very funny movie. Let's watch a clip. Oh yeah, good clip. Okay. Captain, sail off the port bow. Ha ha! 
Let's get after a number two. Aye, aye, sir. Clap on all sail! All 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 Pirate Captain. And I'm here for your gold. Gold? This is a ghost ship. <laughs> Sorry. That was short and sweet. <laughs> oh, that was that was that was definitely edited highlights there, I can tell you. That was uh, How would you like some questions? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. Well, I'm done. We, there's so many okay. people that would love to. Yes, let's do your that. brain. Let's, let's do that thing. Let's do some questions. Let's have the light. What a difference in the change of, uh, of characters from the elf uh, uh, movies as the Christmas one. Mm -hmm. How to? Uh, I have Michael. Try. Uh, how to? Uh, how do you go with the switch from a design and an approach to characters from something like Arthur that's CG to something that's uh, sort of a more classic Ardman style? It's very interesting because because in theory, I always uh, I believe that we can design. In any style, in theory, you know. I mean, I think to be entirely limited to the, um, you know, the kind of the, the classic armor style, I think is, I feel is, is a bit limiting. I know that the audience loves it. I know they do. I realize that. Um, but like at Pixar, for example, you know, each film looks quite different. If one from the other, there's a there are things in common, but they 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 have the luxury of of, of going to of choosing a designer and then. Um, I think they grow in a different way, like you guys. Yes, um, I mean it, it's. How you feel personally changing the style? I feel personally fine about it. I'm I'm perfectly chilled about it. <laughs> yeah, I'm up, yeah I would yes I've been, I'm. I, I know that the, the the classic style with the eyes and the big wide mouth is is much is much loved. It's I mean with the pirates, you know, the, the style is different. It had to evolve because um, it was very interesting seeing um, the curse of the wear of it just now because I've forgotten. Oh yeah, of course, everyone has to be bald because for <laughs> the, uh, because here's a funny thing. I remember I remember on Chicken Run. Uh, saying to Nick Park, this guy's going to need eyebrows. And he said, no, you, you can't, you, nobody has eyebrows. <laughs> because, because, <laughs> because in his world, people don't have eyebrows. But if you've got a hat on or hair, you haven't got that expressive mobile brow. You can't do it. That's, I saw it in the in in um, the cast of the wear out. There's an audience. There's about you know twenty bald guys, and then there's, <laughs> then there's a guy with, with with black hair, and he's got eyebrows on. The bald guys have no eyebrows, and the, and the guy with black hair has eyebrows uh, because that shape above the eyes, whatever however it's done, is the most expressive thing in performance. What the brows, however you delineate it, that's the most. Imp anyway, 
That's a com- complicated answer. To say that the, because the pirates had to have hats, then they had to have eyebrows, and they couldn't have the the amazing um, semi uh, the uh, self articulating brow that Wallace has. Hello, um, I was just uh, hi. Hello. <laughs> um, I was really interested in like what you were saying about, um, I guess, more Hollywood approach to storytelling and developing uh, a character mm-hmm. as opposed to kind of, I don't know if this is exactly what you're saying, but letting a character emerge mm-hmm. or um, yeah. like sort of an emotional story emerge from like the process. Yes. Um, so I, I wouldn't mind just hearing you speak more to that. Um, but I guess my question is, do you ever like come in, like how often does that, um, like how does that affect your process? Like when a character tells you something different, you know, when a character is kind of like asking for something more, do you know what I'm saying? Like um, when you're working with a character and it kind of, it begs something different than what you're doing because the character, you know, needs something in the story or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I'll try and... Do you ever get like surprises, you know? From the character? Yeah, from Um, the character. I want... uh yeah, pr- I think probably you should go with those things, you know. I think that's wh- that's why I think the model whereby you plan a plot, a series of events, and then very early on you start hunting around what what is the what is the emotional story arc in in this series of events. And then you kind of land it, and then oh, that's good. Now we've now we've got now we've got a proper arc, so now we're safe. That probably is quite limiting because then you can't sort of um, follow the the hints that the story might throw up to you. I mean, Wallace and Gromit is very. I, I mentioned Chicken Run and Ginger's lack of arc. Um, Wallace and Gromit, the same. It was very funny. <laughs> I laughed. I laughed. I love to see the people at DreamWorks trying to make sense of, of the Wallace and Gromit story in Hollywood terms yeah. because it barely holds up. It doesn't hold up. In, in other words, you know, Wallace never learns anything because he's a complete <laughs> fool. <laughs> and Gromit doesn't learn anything. Really. They kept trying to kid themselves that Gromit was... They kept, they kept trying to kid themselves that the story was about um, Gromit... Um, trying to change his master and then learning to accept him. Maybe that was in there a bit. Uh, there's a little bit of that. There's a bit of that, but that's not what it's about, yeah. really. I don't think that's what it's about. Yeah. You know, what it's about, if it's, a, what it's about, it's the simplest thing on earth, I think. It's about sort of um, uh, uh, friendship and affection um, or in spite of all the odds, you know, in spite of all the unreasonable things that people really do, you know, it's just, it's just ultimately human warmth, or in this case, human stroke canine warmth, you know, w- triumphs over over other, you know, over ad- adversity. Um, so that was funny. Uh, that, so, you know, if you'd taken the Wallace Gromit story and you get, and you tried to, you know, put the classic. Hollywood structure on it would be so much less interesting, I think. Yeah. Um, and it, and also, we, I'm sure we all know. I'm sure we in this room we all know that thing where you start to watch a movie and you think, oh, I, well, I know how this is going to end up yeah, yeah. because it's so obvious they've established. That here's the character. Oh dear, look at the problems this character's got. You know, you know. Don't worry, it'll, it'll all work out well in the end, and you know they will triumph over adversity. That always happens, and, and they've they've learned they've learned their lesson, and they're, they're better people. You know, and and. Yeah, you know, I'm not. I'm not. Actually, I do sound cynical, don't I? But I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. That, yeah, I, I, I'm. I'm. With Arthur Christmas, I was in tears at the end of that film. And I'm the producer, for heaven's sake. And it wasn't not because it was expensive, but because I found it so moving. I found it genuinely. <laughs> when it gets to the end, I found it genuinely moving. And that's genuine. This is all. I'm, is actually all I'm really talking about. That's. Yeah. That, you know, that, at the the bottom line is is, genu- is genuineness in, st- in storytelling and, and not, not cynicism in storytelling. Thank you very much. Peter, uh, what an incredible journey you've had over the years. Oh, here I am. 
<laughs> and um, I was just, uh, you know, you started out with um, you know, very creatively rewarding ideas and uh, shows and processes and, you know, went through to commercialization and changing technology. I was just curious how you maintain your childlike curiosity and kept your mojo over the years. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you do that, you know. Um, the energy of others is what is... Uh, I'm, I'm, perhaps I'm like a sort of vampire, really. I think there might, might be... A, you know, one, one, one is um, uh, you're buoyed up by the energy of others. But that's a two-way two thing, though, because you won't get their energy if you don't invest energy to get it back. Um, like, you know, this pirate film is very much in front of my mind now, of course, because I've just finished it. And I was on it for five years. And, you know, it was tiring in the middle. It was very tiring in the middle. And um, that, you know, that drive into work on a Monday sometimes was not a thing I, I was too excited about, you know. Um, but... Uh, there were so many people working so hard on on my behalf. At least one of whom is here. <laughs> Leslie is here. So many people working so hard on my behalf um, that that is very inspiring. You know, that's a great feeling. You feel, and actually, having said driving to work, I'm, I, I I said to the crew one time, and I meant it very sincerely. It's like that that. Um, Running the shoot was like driving in some magnificent, in very uh, a Mercedes, a new Mercedes, kind of like very comfortable, very very well engineered, utterly reliable, you know, and fast as well. And just 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 amazing um, support all around me. So that's that's, that's very important, uh, and I do think staying interested in life is important, and other things is important. Uh, other things. I mean, other things beyond filmmaking. I, I never watch any movies at all. It's really embarrassing. It's really embarrassing at work when um, having film conversations and they're saying, oh, I saw this and that. And I'm, and I'm going, hi. Oh, yes, I know. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah great. <laughs> I haven't seen anything they're talking about. Very, very difficult to cast the film because I hadn't seen half the actors that were being suggested to me, you know. So, um, so I, I don't, you know, so I try to avoid films as far as possible and stay interested in the real world. Thank you. Oh, uh, <laughs> th thank you, Chris, and thank you, Peter, so much. It's uh, great to hear you in person. Um, I, I, Canadians are, are really in love with, with Ardman. Uh, Canadians are in love with Shaun the Sheep. Canadians are in love with Creature Comforts, with uh, Wallace and Gromit. It's kind of like a, a religion here. Um, so you don't really have to uh, we buy into the British sensibility because we kind of live with it forever, um, and we've grown up with it, which m would be hard for you to understand from Bristol point of view. But, but here um, uh, we really enjoy it. Uh, has it been a struggle for you? And I, this is a strange question, but to maintain a certain Britishness in the face of this American um, I industrial wall that you have to hit, or? Have, ha, have you had a lot of leeway with those features to be able to retain a British sensibility? That's no, no, very reasonable. It's a good question. Sony have been great, I must say. Um, we, we've made two films with Sony now, Arthur Christmas and The Pirates thing. And they've been fantastically um, supportive and tolerant so far. And uh, I have to say, I've been traveling around the States and... I am aware. I, uh, the more I, uh, the more I'm there, the more different we seem. I mean, it's just, just culturally so different. Now, that's fine. That's good. <laughs> that's how it should be. Uh, no problem at all. And the, and the thing that I don't know, and the thing which, unfortunately, terrifyingly, the next two weeks will show is how receptive they they will be um, en masse, you know. Because I come here, I, I, I visit a, a, 
a multiplex in Phoenix or Miami, I see on the walls the Avengers, you know, and I see, you know, James Cameron's name, and I see, you know, Spider-Man, all this, um, all this stuff, this powerful American culture, with this, this American cultural juggernaut, you know, and I think, how how do we how are we even seen in this world? You know, hello, <laughs> over here, far. Uh, it's really hard to be seen. I, I, I mean, uh, so I'm afraid. I don't, 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 be, too, don't be too revealing. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm. It would be awful if it didn't if it didn't work enough. Our sights are quite low. This is what really pisses me off because, like, like Wallace and Gromit won the Oscar for pity's sake. And any intelligent person thinks it's a brilliant film. And yet it does sort of 60 million in the US box office. The bloody Smurfs will do 200 million. I mean, you know, for pity's sake, really. <laughs> well, you know, and, but, but what can you do? And what can you do? I don't know. what. You, I mean, one thing you could do is we could change what we do. I mean, that's, that's, but that doesn't seem... But that doesn't seem that doesn't seem like break. But we can't. And we you know, we can't do that. We could. But but we don't want to do that. So it's so it's you know, so and so I wish to God we could just have a big success. Not because I want the money, although I do want the money, but because um, <laughs> but because I would just like to say, see, it's possible. It can be British and, and popular. You know, that's all that's what I'd I would love that to happen. Um yes. I would love that to happen. <laughs> but, but I don't know if it will. If everyone in this room goes to see it 37 <laughs> times. Yeah, 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 yeah that'll help. Yeah, yeah. Well, as an animator, I have to say, just on a personal level, thank you so much for what you have personally done for the medium. And uh, there's a lot of students in the room as well. And uh, I know from their perspective, you are such an inspiration and in your company and the work that you do in that heart that makes it up on screen. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and thank you so much for today. And uh, Peter Lord, folks. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.